Not long after the church was organized in Jesus' time, there came an apostasy, and it seemed like every doctrinal disagreement led to thousands of different Christian churches. On April 6, 1830, the time finally came for the Lord to put things right and restore the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. It had been ten years since the first vision, and a time of remarkable schooling for Joseph. The priesthood and baptism were restored, the Book of Mormon was translated, and just a week after the first book was printed in March 1830, the next major step in restoring the gospel was the formal organization of the church at the Whitmer's Log Home in Fayette, New York. The Lord specified this meeting would occur on Tuesday, April 6, 1830. There were about 50 in attendance, and an 1813 New York law required that a church have at least six members to be formally organized. Six men who had been baptized and saw the gold plates became the first official members of the church. Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Samuel H. Smith, Peter Whitmer, Jr., Hiram Smith, and David Whitmer. The meeting was opened by solemn prayer, and Joseph and Oliver asked the other four members if they would accept them as their spiritual teachers. With the consent of those present, 24-year-old Joseph ordained Oliver as an elder in the church, and 23-year-old Oliver ordained Joseph. They were sustained as the church's presiding officers and proceeded to organize it. Now with authorized men called, sustained, and ordained, they partook of the sacrament. They were confirmed members of the Church of Jesus Christ by the laying on of hands and given the gift of the Holy Ghost that was poured out on them to a very great degree. While the rest of the world did not know this event happened, the restoration and organization of the Lord's Church must have been celebrated throughout the heavens. Section 20 was given sometime between April and June 1830 and has been called the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ or Constitution of the Church. Before Joseph could organize the Lord's Church, there needed to be an inspired foundational document written by he and Oliver that decreed the beliefs, policies, and practices for the Church. It also told of the priesthood offices and duties of priests, teachers, deacons, and disciples or elders. This newly organized church was called the Church of Christ. In 1834, it was called the Church of the Latter-day Saints, and in 1838, the Lord said that it should be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Lord said that Joseph was called of God and ordained an apostle of Jesus Christ to be the first elder of the church, with Oliver to be ordained by him as the second elder. Verses 5-8 through eight tell of Joseph's experience translating the Book of Mormon, and that it contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord said this book proves to the world that the Holy Scriptures are true, and God inspires and calls men to His holy work now as He did in the past, showing that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Those who receive it in faith and work righteousness shall have a crown of eternal life, while those who reject it will be condemned. Section 20 testifies of God in heaven, who created men and women after his own likeness and commanded them to love, serve, and worship him. It tells of how he gave his only begotten Son, who suffered the atonement and crucifixion, then rose from the dead, and all who believe are baptized in his holy name and endure to the end will be saved. The Holy Ghost testifies of all things and bears record of the Father and Son and the Godhead, who are infinite and eternal, and work together to prepare us for eternal life. We learn of our responsibilities to repent and believe in Jesus Christ, worship the Father, and endure in faith on His name to the end to be saved in God's kingdom. The Lord taught that justification, which means to be forgiven, pardoned, and declared not guilty, and sanctification, which is to be clean, pure, and holy through the blood of Christ, and His grace are just and true to all who love and serve God with all their mights, minds, and strength. While justification removes the punishment for past sin, sanctification removes the stain or effect of sin. We're told to take heed and pray always to not fall into temptation. Verses 37-38 through 38 teach us of the commandment of baptism, based on Mosiah 9 and Moroni 6 in the Book of Mormon. All who humble themselves before God, 
desire to be baptized, come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits, witness before the church that they truly repented of their sins, are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, determined to serve him to the end, and truly manifest by their works that they have received his spirit unto the remission of their sins, shall be received by baptism into his church. The Revelation tells the duties of elders, priests, teachers, deacons, and members of the Church of Christ. The Lord told Joseph and Oliver that apostles are also elders, with the calling to baptize and confirm people into the Church, by the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, ordain, administer the sacrament, teach, expound, exhort, watch over the Church, and take the lead of all meetings. Duties of priests, teachers, and deacons were also explained and all things must be done in order. There should be a consenting vote of the members before someone is ordained to a church office by the power of the Holy Ghost. We should remember that while priesthood authority comes through ordination, priesthood power comes through obedience and worthiness. We then learn the duties of members after they're received by baptism. New members should be given time to be taught all things concerning the Church of Christ by the elders or priests before they partake of the sacrament. They should show by their godly walk and conversation that their works and faith are in agreement with the Holy Scriptures, and be worthy to have the Holy Spirit with them. Children should be blessed in the name of Jesus Christ, and not be baptized until they reach an accountable age capable of repentance. And we are taught the correct way to perform this ordinance of baptism. The first meeting of the organization of the church focused on what was most important in laying the foundation of the restoration. It is expedient that the church meet together often to partake of bread and wine in the remembrance of the Lord Jesus. The Savior emphasized the importance of the sacrament as he presided over it two days in a row when he visited the Nephites. We're taught how this ordinance should be administered, and both prayers that emphasize remembering the Savior must be said correctly. As we partake of the sacrament emblems, we witness to the Father that we do always remember His Son and are willing to do the things He commanded us to do. The Revelation ends by telling us that a list of church members' names should be kept in a book by an elder, and those expelled from the church have their names blotted out. Members attending a church where they are not known can take a certificate with them, signed by an elder who knows them, to show they are a member in good standing. The Lord revealed Section 21 on April 6, 1830 to those assembled in the Whitmer Log Home for the organization of the church. He established the order of his newly formed church, instructing that there shall a record be kept among you, and Joseph would be known as a seer and translator, prophet, apostle of Jesus Christ, and an elder in the church. Joseph appointed Oliver the second elder in the church and the first church historian. The Lord clarified the relationship of the church to the prophet and instructed the saints, Thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For his words ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. Prophets call us to do things that require both patience and faith, and we must not base our obedience on our understanding but on our conversion. If the Spirit testifies to us that we are led by living prophets, then we should do what they tell us, like Adam did when he was commanded without being told why to offer sacrifices. When an angel asked him what he was doing, he said, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. If the saints did these things, then the gates of hell would not prevail against them. The Lord would disperse the powers of darkness and cause the heavens to shake for their good and his name's glory. He promised a mighty blessing to those who serve and labor in my vineyard, that they would believe his words given through the Comforter. In this revelation, Oliver was designated as the first preacher, an office he filled by preaching the church's first public sermon the next Sunday. Some who wanted to join the newly organized Church of Christ had already been baptized in another faith, and asked Joseph if they needed to be rebaptized. He took the matter to the Lord, and on April 16, 1830, in Manchester, he received the revelation known as Section 22. The Lord explained that all old covenants were done away, and this is a new and an everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning. 
We should remember that the new and everlasting covenant is the fullness of the gospel, including eternal marriage, baptism, priesthood ordination, and every other covenant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord said that they needed to enter in at the straight gate, as he had commanded, and not by their dead works. The revelation ends with a sobering reminder to seek not to cancel your God. The Lord wants things to be done in his church, in order, and how he has commanded. The organization of the Church of Jesus Christ in 1830 was one of the great miracles of the latter days that changed the world, and we should take time to reflect on the miracle of its worldwide growth from such a humble beginning. And these are sections 20 through 22 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Look for hidden objects throughout this video that are a part of church history or something that would have been common to that time and read each object's description to learn about life in the 1800s. You can also look for these other images hidden throughout the video. You can download a coloring page and activity puzzles for each section on Etsy at PonderFun. Visit our Facebook page or PonderFun.com to find more fun things to do and you can listen to these as a podcast. Please like and share these videos with anyone you think might enjoy them and I'll keep making new ones. Thanks again for watching and find some time this week to ponder.